There was nothing remarkable about this house, from the outside at least. It was much like its counterparts in the terrace where it stood. A featureless red brick fascia, doors and two windows front and back, two up, two down. A passageway cut through at one side, built to house local factory workers shortly after the passage of the Public Health Act of 1875. Though these so-called bylaw terraced houses were considered a cut above, having each the luxury of its own outside toilet in the yard, and not a shared one. By the early 1930s, when Jack Lewis first made his appearance in the world, the house had been converted from gas to electric light, and there was indoor plumbing, though the privy remained in the yard. Best place for it, his mother always said. And the reality was... There was precious little space within to install one, though a bathroom extension had been built off the back in the coming years. But on the inside, unlike some of their neighbours, the house had always been kept clean and neat and filled with warmth and love. His mother had seen to that. It was the only family home he'd ever known, at least until he and Marion had married and bought a new build semi-detached with all mod cons on an estate built on the footprint of the local manufacturing works, long gone and just a ten minute walk away. Jack was grateful that Marion and his mother had been close, more of a mother-daughter than daughter-in-law, and so he could never understand when his mother grew frail, why she would not take up their offer for her to move in with them. I was born in this house and I'll die in it, God willing, was her standard response, and in the end she'd got her wish. Jack stood in the back kitchen and peered out of the window into the yard. By this time, it was dark outside and snowing heavily. The latter caused him some concern as, in accordance with her wishes, his mother was to be collected from the house the next day at midday and taken to the burial service. Her casket was in the front room, where she was to spend one final night. The kitchen itself, like much of the house, was largely empty of furniture the majority of the contents having been distributed to extended family or else donated to charity. One of the few exceptions, his father's rocking chair, which he'd kept back for himself, was placed before the open fire, and he seated himself in it and began to rock gently back and forth. It was a comfort. His bed also remained upstairs in the back bedroom above his head, and it was there he would spend the night of his vigil alone if not surrounded by vivid memories. Marion had offered to stay and keep him company, but wasn't unhappy when he'd demurred. She didn't have the shared history of the house, and, he knew, she found the idea of staying the night unsettling. How much more unsettling would she have found it had she known the family law that upon his maternal grandfather's death from TB, his grandmother had had to share the same bed where a grandfather had been laid to rest for a further three nights before his burial. There was nowhere else to put him, his mother had said flatly. It certainly made him shudder. It was enough to make anyone shudder. A different world back then, thank God. He stood again and walked to the back door. Opening it, he took a beer bottle from the outer windowsill, where he'd left a few to chill and brushed off the mantle of snow. He took a bottle opener from the draining board and, returning to the chair, flipped the cap and took a long pull as he stared into the fire. He resolved to build up the fire before bed and keep the cold out and warmth in for the final morning. There was plenty of coal in the scuttle. It needed using up. He'd been very much wanted by his parents. That he knew, and it was also a comfort. They'd been trying for a child for the best part of ten years since they were married and, having failed and finally reconciled themselves to that fact, Jack had come along. No sisters or brothers were to follow. Perhaps they would have, given time, but that is one thing his parents didn't have. Time. His father had been an army reservist, so at the outbreak of World War II, had been amongst the first to be called up. One day his daddy had been there, the next day gone, never to return. Jack had been six years old. Having readied himself for bed, he now lay in the darkness. The bed was cold, but the hot water bottle that had aired it 
warmed his feet, and soon he was snug and comfortable under the cotton sheets and blankets and the patchwork eider down. He fell asleep, still thinking of his father. Special memories of his dad singing him to sleep in that very room, in that very bed, and of that one song in particular. One sad song that always made him cry and say, Don't sing that one, Daddy. Don't sing that one. And then the next night, he'd be asking his daddy to sing it again. He's the little boy that Santa Claus forgot. And goodness knows he didn't want a lot. He woke to hear it being sung, albeit at a distance. He imagined the sound must be coming through the party wall, but surely it was the middle of the night. And as he collected himself, he realised that no, no, it was coming from downstairs, though for the life of him, he couldn't remember having left the radio on. But there it was, the familiar refrain, travelling up the hall stairs. <laughs> He rose then and, wrapping the eider down around him, padded down the stairwell as silently as a mouse. There was a door at the bottom that led directly into the kitchen. It was closed as he'd left it. He paused on the bottom step before opening it, listening intently, his heart beating fast. He knew that voice. How could he not know it? It was his father's voice, and in that instant, Jack felt as if he were six years old again. With a click, he pushed the door open and the singing stopped. He saw the kitchen first, not as it was, but as it had been when he was small. And there, in the rocking chair, sat his father, as vital as he'd ever been, and who now turned his face to greet him and said, with a beaming look, Jackie! Daddy? Hello, son. My, how you've grown. Marion woke early to the sound of howling winds and, peering through the bedroom curtains, was alarmed to see snow that must have lain well over two foot deep in the street outside. Wrapped in a thick dressing gown and slippers, she drank a cup of tea at the kitchen table as she sat before the three-bar radiator with the elements glowing orange and listened to the radio with increasing alarm. It was being reported that snow had drifted to more than 10 feet deep in places, driven by gale-force easterly winds. Overnight, roads and railways had been blocked. City dwellers and villages alike had been stranded and power lines brought down. The near freezing temperatures meant that the snow cover promised to last for days. Listeners were encouraged to batten down the hatches and not to venture out for the duration. At around eight in the morning, the call came on the party line to inform her that, regrettably, in the circumstances, there would be no funeral service that day. It came as a surprise to nobody. But what to do about Jack? Loath as she was to venture out, it was inevitable and unavoidable, and so, having packed a bag full of essentials, she dressed as best she could against the winter onslaught and set out. A journey that should have taken ten minutes took well over twice that as she battled her way through the blinding snow and against the cold easterly wind towards her destination. She didn't knock on the front door. It was never used. Instead, she made her way down the shelter of the side passage to the back of the house and used her own key to let herself in. A fire burned low in the grate, but the warmth in the kitchen was welcome. She shoveled more coal on the fire and boiled the kettle. The house was unusually still, but she reasoned it was still early and, pouring a mug of tea for Jack, went upstairs to wake him. The bed had clearly been slept in, with blankets thrown aside, but there was no Jack. She began to panic then. She called his name. No answer. Setting the steaming mug aside on the bedroom table, she crossed the landing and looked in the front bedroom. No Jack. She then made her way downstairs towards the only other room where he could be. 
With a hand on the door handle to the front parlour, she hesitated. Marion wanted to remember Jack's mother as she had been and not how she was. She'd been such a character, so warm and funny always and <laughs> blunt. She hadn't pulled any punches and had always spoken her mind. But if she loved you, she loved you. And that was that. And Marion counted herself fortunate that she'd been one of the loved. That's how she wanted to remember Jack's mother, alive, not locked in a box. But faced with no alternative, she turned the handle and slowly entered. The coffin rested on two trestle tables. The room was otherwise bare, aside from the figure that was laid on the floorboards alongside. A figure obscured by the eiderdown wrapped round it. A tussled head of hair was all that protruded from it. The room was icy cold and eerily still. Her breath appeared as a misty cloud of condensation as she crossed the room and dropped to her knees beside the bundle. She reached out a hand and touched where the shoulder protruded and shook it, not knowing what to expect. Jack finally began to stir, his face appearing from under the coverlet. Didn't you want to leave your mother alone? she asked. She's not alone, Marion, he smiled drowsily. She's with my father now. When his mother had entered the kitchen to find Jack and his father deep in conversation and creeping up behind his father's back with a finger pressed to her lips, the first words she barked were simply, Where the bloody hell have you been? Before his father stood and turned and she fell into his daddy's arms, never to be parted again. Mm-hmm.